Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. I just want to extend my welcome to all of you. If you are new to IFJF Seattle, um, welcome. Welcome to IFJF Seattle. Uh, thank you so much also for those tuning in online. Uh, really appreciate all of you here. Um, man, how many of you know that we are at the end of January? We have been talking about our vision. Uh, today will be my uh, last session uh, where we share about our vision. Uh, and then next week, we're going to kick, kick, uh, kick start a new sermon series. It's a relationship sermon series. It's a Valentine uh, theme. Uh, it's called The Naked Truth. So don't miss that. Invite your friends, um, and we're going to kick start uh, that, okay? Uh, I am very appreciative of those people that have partnered with us in that pledge, the 100 for 100. I uh, really appreciate uh, the 44 of you that have already uh, signed up. I really want to thank you for doing that. I uh, also want to thank our fundraising team. You know, you guys have been working tirelessly uh, and putting all of your efforts to reach not only here, our local congregation, but also our alumni all over the world. So thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had our Vision Sunday. To those of you who missed that, you can go uh, online to our website, abjafseattle.org, and you can listen to our sermon uh, of our vision on, uh, on that Sunday. Uh, the main thing about what God spoke to me uh, at the end of last year as I was preparing, I was praying for this church, where are we going, you know, what's going to happen in 2024 for IFJF Seattle, what happened to IFJF Seattle five years from today, how about 25 years from today? I know to, to many of you it feels like 25 years, Pastor, you are just jumping ahead of yourself. Believe me when I said this, 25 years is almost like a blink of an eye. Okay, 25 years ago, I became a pastor, uh, not knowing what's going to happen, and here I am, uh, you know, looking back, 25 years have just passed just like that. Uh, so uh, we have to plan, you know, especially as leaders, we have to plan, we have to seek God, we have to pray and ask for God's direction for, for one year, five years, 25 years, amen? And what God gave me is, uh, which I'm going to read to you in Ephesians chapter 4, we have been reading about Ephesians chapter 4 for a few Sundays now, but today is the day where I'm going to unpack Ephesians chapter 4. I'm excited about it, but there's one key word, one key word for IFJF Seattle for 2024 and maybe beyond is the word unity. Unity. Am, is, is my, am I ringing or is it truly ringing? Okay, I just want to make sure. Phew, you know, I thought I'm growing older and my ear starts to ring. Uh, but the key word is unity. Can you say it out loud? Unity. Unity. There is no unity in that word. <laughs> say it together. Three, two, one. Unity. Sounds better. Okay. So today I want to begin with uh, uh, very simple jokes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> simple jokes. How do you know? How do you know if a person is optimist or pessimist? Okay, and I want you to pronounce this word. Okay, show it. Okay, done, 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 done. Okay, how many of you see opportunity is now here? Opportunity is now here. How many of you see that word? All right, if you see that word, you are optimist. If you see that opportunity is nowhere, then you are pessimist. Derek, you got it now? <laughs> so, read it again, okay? <laughs> the, this coming week is a crucial week. Do you, do you guys know why? Because this is where most resolution got dumped. <laughs> and I just found this very fascinating too. 2020 divided by 5 is 404. No wonder that year was an error. There you go. Come on. Hey, I can be an engineer too. <laughs> they say, they say a house divided against itself cannot stand. But why is one house divided by one house equal one house? It's a math joke. It's a math joke. Okay. <laughs> I felt like Joe Coy. <laughs> I felt like Joe Coy. <laughs> you know, and Taylor Swift, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not going there. Okay, I, I love Taylor Swift. Okay, no, no, I'm not going there. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. I'm going to read it in the New uh, International Version. Um, and it says this, As a prisoner of the Lord, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So each and every one of you, yes, each and every one of you, even though you don't feel that you are it, you are called by God. And that calling has been already given to you. You actually have already received it. You just need to discover it. You just need to develop it. You just need to walk in it. You just need to say yes to it. So walk a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the, the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Look, unity doesn't come naturally because each and every one of us are very selfish by itself. We were born selfish. Take a look at a baby. Have you ever stole candies from a toddler? Oh man, they're going to cry like, like the world is going to end. Why? Because we are born selfish. We're just thinking about ourselves, thinking about me, I, and myself. Right? So we have to make every effort to keep unity. Even sometimes when unity is hard. Hey, brothers and sisters in our just adults, we need to make every effort to keep that unity. Okay? Yesterday we had a prayer. Uh, team huddle uh, as I was praying as I was worshiping God gave me a, a sign where well, you know we are all lining up and holding hand in hand no gap no gap everybody is holding hand in hand and no gap why because we are called to stand in the gap of the generation so let's not break this bond let us not be disunited let us not let the devil enter into the unity of the house because if the, the devil is allowed just a little bit window to enter into this house, he will be able to take control of this house. And we don't want that. Okay? Keep every effort in unity. There is one body, one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. We are here because you, you, we are called by God, and we are here because we want to serve one God, one spirit, and one vision, which is to bring the gospel to the end of the world and to transform people into knowing Christ. That is our goal. That is our uh, vision, just as Sean has already mentioned. Take a look at this, okay? In John chapter 17, shortly before Jesus went to the cross, he actually prayed. Jesus prayed for the unity for his followers, for his disciples. So that tells you how crucial for all of us, disciples of Christ, to be united. Because Jesus, you know, there's so many things that Jesus will have done before he went to the cross. But he decided to just stay back and pray for the unity of his believers. John 17, 21, it says, That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 23. I in them and you in me. This is still Jesus praying. So that they may be brought to complete unity. This is the prayer of Jesus. Is that you and I, we are brought in complete unity. And we need that. We need that. Then, listen to this. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So as you can see, the unity is very important to Jesus. And my thesis today is that unity in church, unity in God, will allow the world to know who our God is. Right? Through our unity, people, the world will know who Jesus is. So it is very crucial. Amen? I want to also say last week, I think a couple weeks ago, I said that unity is not uniformity. Uniformity means that we are all the same. Everybody is the same, right? You look like me, then I can be united with you. You talk like me, you talk the same language as me, then I can be united with you. Oh yeah, if your color is like my color, then you can be united with me. Oh yeah, if you behave this certain way, then you can be united with me. No, unity is not uniformity. 
Actually, I, I posted this in my Instagram. How many of you know? Yeah, Instagram, right? I posted this in my Instagram in November 1st, 2020. And, and I said this, uniformity leads to conformity. Don't, don't, don't focus on my photo, okay? <laughs> Just read. Just read. Please. Okay, that's why I make it black and white. Okay, just read. Be because the, the word that I said here in November 1st is very important and it makes sense, especially today as we enter 2024, election year. Okay, uniformity leads to conformity to the human influence, unity leads to the conformity to the image of God. It is a very crucial year for us, this nation, this church, that we need to be united that we need to declare that Jesus is King of King, Lord of Lord, that we, you know, our God is not a God of the Democrats, our God is not the God of the Republicans, they are the, He is the God of all, Father of all, and we need to be united, right? It is very crucial, especially this year, 2024, that we need to be united, because our unity will lead us to the conformity to the image of God. I want to read to you this book. Uh, it's an excerpt from a book written by Brad McCracken. The, the book title is called Uncomfortable, The Awkward and Essential Challenge of Christian Community. Let me read it to you, okay? It says, a unified church is one of the strongest evidence of the truth of the gospel. A unified church gives the message to the world, the truth of the gospel. This is especially true in a world as fragmented and divisive as ours, where countercultural and unity among diverse people stands out. When the rest of the world can't seem to agree on anything or bear to be around who are, uh, people who are different, a church where natural enemies become siblings in Christ is a powerful alternative. Unity is a critical manifestation of a spirit and power church. That's why Paul told the Ephesian Christians to be eager to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It is why he wrote to the Corinthians, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that all of you agree that there are no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Can you say amen? That's a wonderful uh, writing, right? I want to share with you first our enemy scheme, the Satan scheme. If we know our enemy scheme, then we know how to actually fight back, right? The enemy scheme, there are three strategies that the enemy always use. The same all over generation, even from Adam and Eve all the way to us and for the future. Same scheme. Number one is that distraction. The pressure to conform to this world rather to his word caused us to, do, to be so easily distracted. How does the, the devil try to disunite us? Is to distract us. Some example of his scheme of distraction can be in the form of comparison. You are on social media so much and you compare your life to the posts of those people you followed and then you are distracted, right? And then you tell your husband, you tell your wife, you tell your boyfriend, your girlfriend, why can't we be this post? Dude, those posts are not even real, okay? How many of you have ever seen a post where a, a, a husband and wife are fighting? You have never seen that. You only see, oh, date night, hashtag blast. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, my kids went to Harvard, hashtag blast. I have never seen any parents like, oh, my kids are so dumb. He got an app at school, hashtag stupid. Believe me, they are those kids. Sorry, Asian parents, Asian parents. Okay, let's follow, let's follow. Another one could be, uh, could be sending your friends, uh, you know, who are so much fun, playful, uh, that you wasted so much time on unproductive, ungodly activities. How many of you have those friends, you know, distracting you? You know, finals is tomorrow, and then your friends say, ah, it's okay, don't worry, we still have time. You know, we can burn the midnight oil. You know, it's only 10 p.m. Let's just play. We come home at 2. You still have four hours to study. <laughs> then you get distracted. Or another example is you are pulled to so many directions that you push what is necessary in the back burner. 
and you procrastinate. You chose to be busy on things that are not important, that you push what is actually important. That also can be a distraction. The subtle and powerful effect of distraction is real, but it's actually curable. It begins with personal resolve to recognize it and have the discipline to fight against it. I'm not a procrastinator, so I, I like to do things timely, and I don't like to wait till last minute. That's not me. I, I know some people say, ah, that's, that's just too lame, you know? Like, that's just me. I don't like to, you know, like prepare my sermon like at midnight on Saturday night. I, I don't do that, okay? Because sometimes I need prayer, sometimes I need God to speak, and then if God don't speak at midnight on Saturday, oh, I'll be doomed because I'm not a good public speaker. I need the Lord to speak because if the Lord doesn't speak, I don't speak. I'm like the, you know, ventriloquist, okay? <laughs> so number one, distraction. Number two is deception. The Bible said that the devil is the father of lies, John 8, 44. The devil put thoughts in your mind and you begin to foster these thoughts in your mind and now you have these pre preconceived ideas of your friends of the people around you of this church of the leadership of pastor Irwan, you know about the leaders about about anybody the devil put those thoughts in you once the devil put thoughts in your mind and you foster those thoughts that could be trouble right sometimes it's like that sometimes the devil could be your friends <laughs> You know, like, oh, look at Pastor Irwan, you know, the way he preached is so singlish. I don't understand, you know, what a bad language, bad example. And then suddenly you foster, oh, yeah, that's right. The way he talks is so weird, you know, so funky. I think he shouldn't preach anymore because singlish is not an acceptable word, you know, American English, you know. <laughs> and then you come to church with that preconceived idea. And then when I start speaking and they're like, oh, gosh, please stop. That singly is good, so bad, you know. It could be. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the power of assumption. You guys remember that? Of course you don't. Don't, don't lie to me, right? <laughs> power of assumption is making assumptions about someone or the church or the community and spreading those conversations negatively among each other. This could be dangerous. This could be unhealthy. It blocks you from receiving the truth. Right? So be careful about this. Deception. Number three is division. When he is successful in distracting you, in decepting you, then he will start to divide you. The devil can easily tear down our unity, our togetherness, our oneness, our friendship, just because he was able to distract you and deceive you. Be careful this is a warning so how do we maintain unity let's circle back to the passage okay uh, in ephesians chapter 4. Uh, oh side note side note side note okay so this unity does not only talk about church it can also talk about your marriage okay this is a precursor to next week okay so this unity can also talk about your marriage about your relationship about your family the same way same way okay it can be applied that way so let's Let's read and let's unpack from Ephesians chapter 4. It says, As a prisoner from the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So number one from this passage is that to, in order for us to keep unity, we need to have humility. Humility. Humility is a key ingredient to maintain unity. Husband and wife, if you don't have humility, it's very hard to build unity among your marriage, among your family. Humility. Can you imagine if you're stubborn? You're always, you know, you want to be right all the time. And you don't give a chance for someone to speak into your life, to discuss respectfully any disagreement. You know, in 2020, the crazy thing is like, there's so much conspiracy theory in 2020 that even good friends, when we argue, we don't even understand what we argue. How many of you felt that way? You know, you argue a certain proposition to your friend and he argue his position and we don't even know what are we arguing. We're confused, right? 
And then there's all this conspiracy theory about the mess, about, about, uh, about Donald Trump, Donald Duck, you know, the, 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 what do you call this? What? The vaccine, you know. It's like, yeah, and the government putting chips into your, into your arm. Uh, you know, uh, the government is, uh, is uh, watching over you, listening over you. He already done that. Even without the vaccine, the government is already listening to us. Come on, if you have your iPhone, if you have any phone, that is called smartphone. You know why they are called smartphone? Because it's hired by the government. It got to be smart. It will report whatever we talk about today. I better stop, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, they will cancel our five. No, I'm just kidding. I don't care, okay? But, but be careful, because if we are not humble enough to respectfully listen, then it's going to create this unity, okay? Come on, guys. This agreement, no big deal, okay? Leadership, church, people, family, we have these agreements, okay? People say like, oh, this church uh, has conflict. Which church doesn't have conflict? Right? The moment you move to that church, there is conflict. Because there is you. Right? <laughs> Again, I'm very blunt. Okay? When people come and say, oh, I don't like A church. You know, I tried A church. Not a perfect church. I moved to B church. Also, I don't like it. I moved to C church, D church. Now I'm in IFGF, the F church. Okay? <laughs> and then I said, by the way, do you see the common denominator of the problem? What does church A, church B, church C, D, and E have? You. So, in conclusion, the F church is not going to work for you too, if you don't humble yourself. Okay? By the way, I have asked, I have told that to somebody. This is a true story. Yeah, I've told him, oh, hi, are you new? He said, yeah, I'm actually from this church, from that church. Said, oh, why do you move to, to this church? Oh, because that church is not perfect. Oh, so you mean this church perfect? He said, yes, I heard that this church perfect. Oh, wrong story, <laughs> wrong address. This is the craziest church. <laughs> See, some of them already know. If you have a pastor that look like this and behave like this, and you already know this is the craziest church. No way. That's why we are called the IF. GF church. Not trying to be vulgar, but you know, it's, this is a crazy church. We're not perfect, but fortunately, we have a perfect God. Thank God we have a perfect Jesus. Come on. So be humble. Be humble, okay? If you think that this church is not perfect, you're right. You're right. Number two, gentleness. Gentleness. God wants us to grow strong in giving grace to others. Okay? Giving grace to one per another person is simply to forgive them. Unconditionally, just as God forgave us through Christ Jesus. Amen? In Colossians 3, it says, bear with each other. You know when the word bear is not a good word i bear you you know if you ever say that to your girlfriend i think she will kick you he said oh i stay with you because i bear it with you that means it's like i can't bear with you i'm trying my best to stay right bear with each other that means it's not always nice it's not always easy but you got to bear with each other forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another forgive as the lord forgive you just as we don't deserve God's forgiveness, someone you know may not deserve yours. The funny thing about grace is that you always want grace to quickly be given to you. But you are always, always slow to give it to those that want it. Think about it, right? When we are at fault, we always say, please forgive me. Please give me grace. Please understand me. But then on the flip side, when somebody is asking you, you refuse to give it. Because you just don't have the humility and the gentleness to give it. And that causes division. Okay? I, checked. I said, 
Don't judge people too quickly. Don't judge people too quickly because you don't know what they have been walking. Take a look at this video. Hey, you. you got to get down. Come on. There's a lot to talk about on this subject, so I'll just keep it for future sermon. But don't judge too quickly, okay? Number three, be patient. Be patient. Every person is different. How we talk, how we respond, how we behave, react, thing could be different. But that does not mean one is better than the other, right? We must be patient and try to put yourself in the shoes of that other person. Don't judge them too quickly because you don't know what they are going through. There is an excerpt from another book and it's written by Tamara Ecclestone and it says this, don't talk about me until you have talked to me. Don't underestimate me until you have challenged me. Don't judge me until you know me. Number four, bearing one another in love. Bearing one another in love does not mean that we just agree on everything your brothers and sisters do even though it might lead them to destruction or death. Bearing one another must also have a component of the boldness to speak the truth in love. Okay? Speaking with respect and compassion, we must not shy away from God's truth. What do you call that? A, uh, uh, oh, I lost the word. You know, this is a very common word being used now culturally, is that you must tolerate. That word, tolerate. Tolerate is not a virtue, guys. Tolerate is not a virtue. Tolerate means that I don't care. It's none of my business. Okay, because if you love, you don't tolerate. For example, if I'm married to my wife and I love her very much, she loves, you know, we love this relationship. And one day my wife said, hey, dear honey, you love me so much, right? I said, yeah, I love you. He said, would you please tolerate if I start going and sleeping with other men every week? Oh, yes, honey, I love you. I tolerate you. Go. Isn't that weird? I don't think that's the right word to use, tolerate. Tolerate is not love. Tolerate means like I don't care enough to fight. I just accept whatever you want to do. Because if I love my wife, do you think I will allow my wife to sleep around with other men every week? No. And I, if I don't tolerate that, does not mean that I don't love her? No. I love her. That's why I don't tolerate. Right? So the same way with us. When we bear one another in love, does not mean that we have to tolerate and keep, keep one eyes closed. It means that we care enough to say something to that person. Say it. If that person is walking off the cliff, tell them, tell him, tell her, hey, stop. You're walking off the cliff you are going to die, right? If you tolerate that person and say, oh, I feel bad though, telling that person that he is walking off the cliff, so bad, I better tolerate. Bloop. Oops. Is that. That's tolerate. But love is not like that. So if you see your brothers and sisters moving towards destruction, moving towards the cliff, say something. Say it in love because you care. Amen? If you read this passage in Ephesians chapter 4, specifically verse 13, it says this. Okay, let me read it in verse uh, 11 and 12 first. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity god has a plan for this church he is calling pastors teachers evangelists all of these functions so that we can all reach unity it's god's prayer 
It's God's desire. It's, it's in his heart to see his people be united. Okay? He says, you need it, uh, so until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God and become mature. That's what we have been talking about, right? In the care groups now, we are doing Bible studies all over the care groups. Why? Because we want to have the knowledge of God. We want to have encounter with God. We want to become mature, attaining to the whole measure, listen to Nick, of the fullness of Christ. The goal of us to be united so that we can grow in maturity, you grow in maturity, and so that you know the fullness, the full measure of our God, Jesus Christ. That is the vision for this church. That our unity must be rich for the maturity of believers in the knowledge of Jesus so that we can attain not only the knowledge, not only knowledge, not only smart here, but you need to have the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. How do we do that? Ask yourself, have you ever truly experienced the living God in your life? What is your testimony? Everybody quiet, right? But I challenge you, think about a testimony in your life that God is truly working and is alive in your life. Oh, I have a lot of stories, but not today, okay? Um, we have no more fasting, so we can have lunch after this. Okay. <laughs> Colossians 3, Colossians 3, I'm going to finish. Colossians 3, 13 to 14, it says, Bear with each other, forgiving one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave them. And over all these virtues, listen to this, put on love. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let's all stand. Psalm 133 verse 1. Man, so many verses. I hope you guys remember that. Psalm 133 verse 1. It says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Okay, to wake everybody up, I'm going to read this verse again, and then you guys are going to shout out that last word, okay? How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. unity. Amen. I declare it over IFJF Seattle. I declare it over our community. I declare it over your family. Declare it over your relationship as husband and wife, as boyfriend and girlfriend. Come on. Have unity. In conclusion, IFJF Seattle. Hey, let's make a commitment for each and every one of us to contribute towards the unity of the house. It cannot be done by one person. It cannot just be me yelling at everybody, unity, unity. Everybody has to play a part, okay? Even when it gets ugly, even when it gets ugly, unity, unity. We work through it, okay? We work through it. No problem. I, I had experienced disagreement so many, many times. No problem. I don't shy away this, from disagreement, but respectfully talk to me. And then we can, you can listen to my story. I listen to your story. Amen? So that our unity can help others to know who our God is and to help us grow in our maturity so that we can attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen? I want to close with an act of togetherness and unity. I want us to hold hands from end to end. Don't let it break. I know some of you might have to make this way. Get close. And we're going to pray together as an act. Don't break, okay? Make sure each line don't break. Try to, try to, like this. There is an empty spot here. Uh, come, 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 close together. Come, 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 come. Wow. Okay, where is my? Hold on, hold on. I need to do my Insta. You know. <laughs> That's why they call me Insta Pastor, for a reason. Because I need to do Insta. You guys look beautiful, by the way. Oh, so beautiful. Come on. Come on, come on. Pretend to be happy. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. This is unity. Holding hand to hand, together and oneness. Come on, I've just Seattle. Let's be united, okay? So that every one of us can grow in maturity, in the knowledge of God and in the fullness of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the word of God, Father God. Thank you for giving 
that fresh revelation to your servant to share to this house. Father God, I speak and declare unity over this church. Yes, we are different. Yes, there are differences. Yes, we are not perfect. Yes, there will be conflicts. But yet, Father God, we are called to be one. Let there be oneness. Let there be togetherness. Let there be unity among brothers and sisters. So that in everything that we do, Father God, let us glorify your name. So that in our unity, the world will know who our Lord is, Jesus Christ. So that as we are united, we will grow in maturity, we will grow in the knowledge of God, and we will experience the full measure of Christ in our personal life. Unity, Father God. Thank you so much for this morning that we can be together in this place, love one another, bear with one another. Thank you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let's all lift our hands up. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Let's lift our hands up, would you? Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for every individual in this room. Different people are going through different seasons of life. Let's not compare with one another. Because you might be in the fall season, and that person might be in the winter season. The other person might be in the summer season. And then yet, here I am, maybe in the spring season. We are in a different season. But God is a God of a constant God that is through different seasons. He is faithful. He is good. Oh, His mercy endures forever. Therefore, Father God, I pray and speak blessing over you. That the countenance of the Lord Jesus shall shine upon you. And the favor of God rests on you. As you depart from here, may you bring the mercy from the throne of the Father, the love through the Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you from today till eternity, till the second coming of Christ. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday, everyone. Thank you.